Okay, it's 6 o'clock, so I think we'll start these proceedings. Uh, welcome all of you here. Uh, I ask you to keep in mind as we proceed here that Eastside County Schools uh, empowers all students to become productive, responsible citizens of an ever-changing global society. Uh, this, the format tonight will be two hearings, one following the other, and uh, then a board meeting to follow that. Once we've had the hearings and uh, have gotten some input, we should know where we want to go, and then we'll have a board meeting to make a decision on what that will be. So uh, I'd like to call the uh, hearing number one to order. It's, uh, we want to receive public comments uh, relative to a proposed instructional support levy funded by a combination of property tax and income surtax. And I think I'm going to ask Dr. Feeney to talk just a little bit about an instructional support levy. And if it's all right, I'm going to give everyone a hot off the press handout. I can do that. We'll wait till you get that, and then I'll, I'm going to run through some of it and give you some background on uh, where the document comes already. from as well. And that's certainly for your keeping and sharing and asking questions. It's just data and information, and that's what we'll be spending our time with. Yeah, the print's a little small, Chris. Sorry. Arms are getting shorter the older we get. Uh, All right, the top copy is uh, just a little bit of background, too. It's a PowerPoint, that's, it's a general PowerPoint about the instructional support levy and uh, really understandable terms. It's put together by Larry Siegel and Margaret Buckton, uh, who are with, who really are the partners in Iowa School Finance Information Services, uh, ISPIS. Um, instructional support levy, as you go through that, uh, really is a local district's opportunity or option to uh, supplement funding in the operating budget, in the general fund. And it's important, to, they talk a little bit in here about the different funds uh, in school finance in general. Um, for instance, some of you are familiar with the physical plant and equipment levy, the Pebble Fund. That one is specified money that's generated for Pebble has to be spent uh, for purposes of Pebble. The instructional support levy does the same thing except it's a bit broader and it can be used for anything that's in the general fund, operating budget. Uh, things that come to mind in there would be textbooks, curriculum, curriculum development, uh, salaries, benefits, uh, anything that's legal according to, uh, to code with the general fund. Um, the instructional support levy uh, I'll go real quickly is that there's really two options for a local district to, to uh, consider doing this. The first option is that it can be a board approved resolution um, and that's up for a maximum of five years. That's not on the table. The board has, has uh, already uh, publicly uh, said uh, and rightfully so in my opinion that this is a, a decision for the voters. That's the second option is that uh, uh, you, you pass the appropriate resolutions in the appropriate timeline and then you put it before the voters. And that's the, the purpose of the hearing. It's a piece of, of the process. Um, instructional support levy can be funded by two, uh, really in two ways. It can be strictly property tax and it can be a combination of property tax and income surtax. Now, uh, most of us are familiar with property tax. Income surtax is, is a bit of a unique feature. Um, it's not the amount of money that you make, and this is where it gets a little confusing. It's the amount of tax liability you have to the state of Iowa. So wherever, whatever line that is on your 1040 or whatever form you're using, it's not dealing with the, the money that you, you make. It deals with what your tax liability is. How much do you owe the state in taxes? And then it's a percentage of that. Other things about the instructional support levy is that uh, district cannot exceed 20% um, uh, of its operating budget with income surtax, and the new district has zero income surtax at this point. Um, so 
so that really isn't a consideration. Uh, lots of things, and we can answer other questions, but the bottom line is that the instructional support levy is really the only way the local district has an option of, of supplementing its general fund. That really is what the instructional support levy is. Uh, and then we'll get in as the hearing goes on, I'm sure we'll get into the uh, benefits and, and drawbacks to property tax or income surtax and, and we'll answer all the questions. The rest of the packet is additional information because um, both the board and I, I, I think I'm speaking for the board but they'll speak for themselves here shortly um, and myself. Our job is really to present uh, as accurate of information to our patrons as we possibly can. Uh, so that our, our uh, constituents can make an informed decision come uh, September 13th. So I guess I did skip around a little bit. Uh, election, uh, if the board approves uh, pursuing this later uh, this evening, it will be on the ballot on Tuesday, September 13th in conjunction with the school board election. And the reason for doing that is that uh, uh, there's really four times during the course of the year that you can have a school election and running it in conjunction with the school board election saves us money, we can get a two for one. That's the purpose. Um, all right, after the uh, PowerPoint that's, that was provided by ISFES, uh, then there's information in the, that I put together, but it's all cut and paste uh, from various sources, and all the sources are listed. Uh, gives you the code, uh, the Iowa code, where the instructional support program uh, is talked about. And if anyone wants an electronic version, I'll send it to you so you can click on the links and look up what all of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, links are in there. Uh, then on page two, actually, of that particular document, um, that was taken from uh, the Department of Iowa Department of Ed website. It's a quick snapshot of the instructional support levy. And then over on page uh, is, uh, three, four, and uh, five, uh, are frequently asked questions. Again, I didn't generate any of this. This was all taken from uh, either the Department of Ed website or um, ISFIS website. So that's just additional information explaining the instructional support program. Because some of our, our patrons would be very familiar with the instructional support program, others would not. And so we're, 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 uh, we're just trying to bring everybody along. All right, the next page, um, <laughs> it's another number one. Um, this is, is what some of the data is telling us. It's the Instructional Support Program Rationale, uh, and that's listed. Um, it just, it strikes me that there's really two questions that will be in people's minds. Uh, there'll be lots of questions, but two basic headings. One is, why do you need the Instructional Support Program, the Instructional Support Levy? And two, how much is it going to cost me? And most questions will fall under those two categories, I, I believe. Uh, so we attempted to provide data uh, to answer the first question. Um, why does the district need the Instructional Support Program? Uh, and it's listed, and those are just factual numbers. Uh, uh, enrollment is, is part of it. I do want to draw attention to that second paragraph because I've heard, uh, I've heard uh, a comment, because I've been talking to people about the instructional support program. I heard a comment that, uh, oh, the spring the, that uh, I and the board talked about growth of the district. Uh, and I did. I openly said the growth of the district. I never have mentioned that we anticipate growing in student population. Growth is intended, when I've used that term previous, is that we grow programs. We get better. We continue to, to get better as a school system. So if there's any confusion that at some time or another I or the board talked about uh, that uh, a couple months ago we were growing and now we're declining, that's just not accurate. Plain and simple, that's not accurate. Um, what was said is what I just mentioned. Uh, bullet point two deals with increased expense of IPERS. Um, that was arbitrary, the law changed, and so we, before we ever started building the budget for fiscal year 12, uh, we were down 1.12%. In real money, John estimated that at 53000 When I say estimate, uh, it's because uh, guessing at what some overtime and things would be, it's impossible to give you an exact number. It's just, that's not possible. Uh, district incentive money uh, is a biggie. 
as you're aware, when SAC and WLVA started whole grade sharing, I assume you're aware there's uh, there there was incentives to do that, uh, and those incentives uh, turn into reorganization incentives. And right now, uh, the, the the figure is five hundred eighty-one thousand dollars a year, and and uh, at the end of uh, June 30th, 2015. Um, and at one time I thought it was 2014, that's been clarified to be 2015, all of that money will be no longer received by the district, 581000 Okay, uh, next bullet point, allowable growth is set annually by the Iowa legislature, uh, and uh, allowable growth in, uh, was set at 0% for fiscal year 12, uh, was set at 2% for fiscal year 13. Um, the figure that's used, uh, that, that uh, Margaret and uh, Larry uh, advise districts about is to anticipate your expenses going up 4% when you start building a budget with unknowns. Uh, that may be liberal, it may be conservative, who knows, but it's in the ballpark. So just framing that, uh, anticipated expenses increasing of 4%, 0% new money coming in. Um, hence, couple that with declining enrollment, um, there, there's a need. Um, and that's all factual information, people. That's not opinion that you can test, you can check the facts, it's all there. Uh, the, the other two bullet points that we're sharing um, uh, are not really quantifiable as facts. These are observations and what, uh, what, what we're pointing uh, to. Uh, dealing with the Iowa Core curriculum and updating curriculum in general and some of the expense that would be anticipated with that over the coming years. Uh, and then also uh, the need to continue moving in the area of technology, and that's explained. Okay. Um, you want the projected enrollments, if you turn that sheet over, uh, this is taken directly from the Department of Education website and what our projected enrollment would, will, will be. Uh, they're projecting at uh, 910 students for this uh, year down to 894 at the end of uh, uh, 15 and 16. And they have some formula for doing this. It's a uniform formula that's used with all districts. It's just, again, it's a cut and paste. Uh, the last document, uh, actually, we just received today, and this is new for the, the board as well, uh, and trying to answer some of the questions. Again, it's, it's another uh, question and answer dealing specifically with our uh, budget. It deals with funding and how that all works. And then the last page of this handout um, is, I think, a very interesting one. And again, all of the figures on that spreadsheet on the last page are actual East Sac County figures for 2012. Now, we have to make sure you understand we're, we're given, sharing as much information, accurate information, based on 2012. We don't know what 2013 will look like, so the numbers won't be exactly the same but it get, conceptually it gets everybody on the same page and they're going to be close. But this is the most recent current available data that we have. And that chart is a little confusing, but it's really helpful. Um, the top one on the ISL scenarios for East Sac County, uh, if that, those are percentages because you can go up to 10% of your operating budget, so it's zero through 10. Um, and then the next column is if uh, there was 0% uh, income surtax. So 1% instructional support levy would generate $44,740 based on fiscal year 12. Now what's I think interesting is jump down to the bottom uh, chart, property tax change at varying income tax, the bottom one. And you'll see the ISL amount at 1%, 0% income surtax. The increased tax per thousand of taxable valuation would be, point, would be 15 cents. And you can do that with all of those and move your way across if you want to see what it looks like with income surtax as well as property tax mix. And that one takes a little bit of, of playing, but it, it needs a little bit of explanation. Um, and then, uh, well, the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay? I'll turn to Chuck. Uh, how close are we to that 910? I mean, do you think that's... Which page are you on? On the enrollment. <laughs> I think we're going to be slight, uh Oh, for 910 or for... Well, this? it says uh, 11, 12, 910 students. I just want oh, to... Oh, 910. I thought you were talking about year 910. No, no, no. I'm talking about 910. Is that 
close, uh, within 10 people, or how yes. close are we to that? I would say that's going to be close. I mean, within, I just... With, uh, close defined as within 10, I would say yes. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, that's probably more than I should have. Should have never given me a form. We would uh, <coughs> entertain any questions or just accept ideas, information, anything you want to share with us. Hey, yeah, Gordon, you guys just, you guys decide on the percentage, or if you're if you're going to levy it at all. Both. And then if, when you decide on a percentage, is that movable every year? See, we can, yes. We can, we can uh, put the, if we would vote this levy, there's nothing that says that we have to collect any of it in a given year. We could set the percentage for that year at zero. And then that, or that's we could set, set it at year. 10. One year. Seven. That's set for one year. Is that both income and property? You have to set them both and you can set them independently? If, and if you use both, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. If you use a combination, yes, you have to set them both. That's all done at, uh, um, prior to the budget hearing in, in March. All of those decisions have to be made for the following year. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the public is just voting on whether they want to do it at all. Right. The percentage is set by the school board right. each year, just so I can... Each year, yeah. so we could be zero this year and ten percent next year because we're whatever, right. and five percent four years from today. Right. We know that the statute keeps us from going beyond ten. It's not good for ten years. This left me beyond ten percent. Yeah. Ten, ten oh, years and ten percent yeah. can't exceed ten percent, which for us is about. I don't have that exact number here. Is about five point six million. So ten percent of that is whatever we could generate up to like five hundred sixty thousand. Now, what's different, and when you read the materials, when you have a chance to really get into them, you'll see that we can't really generate five hundred sixty thousand. Because the third piece that I didn't talk about is that the state, when they did the instructional support levy, I think back in ninety three, if I remember right, something like that. Uh, said that the state there would be state aid up to a, a 25 percent of whatever the local districts did. That lasted about 24 seconds. Uh, it's still in the code, but they have frozen it for the next two years. So um, we cannot generate 560 thousand. We can generate 447 four, four, four hundred forty-seven thousand. And the reason those numbers might be a mismatch is because the code still has state aid being part of it, and it doesn't exist. That, Make any sense? We have to put this together before we certify the budget, and uh, in a case like this year, we went to the end of the end of the school year without knowing what the state was going to do. You know, the governor and the legislature couldn't get together on what they were going to do as far as vulnerable <coughs> growth is concerned. Now, finally, they have set it at two percent, but nothing for this year. Two percent for next year. And uh, the governor has just uh, finished an education summit, which you know is going to cost us money if you follow that at all. And it'll be very interesting to see whether or not they fund it. I mean, lots of lip service given to education again, but it's going to be interesting to see if it's followed with any money. So we vote on it in September, yes. and then you guys don't take any action on it until March? It, right, it would affect our next budget. Do you have any idea what you're looking at in March? No. We would know a lot closer uh, by the end of uh, by the end of this calendar year on, on, on where we're coming in at. Um, well, elaborate on where are we at right now? Right now, the, uh, that's a great question, Gene. Um, and we have to be just very transparent and blunt about this. We have about 2.1 million in cash for this district, and that's a lot of money. What I preface that, though, is that the uh, financial, uh, school finance people recommended level of cash in the bank is equal to three months of expenses if you never took in another dime. And for this district, about 2.1 million is just under what our expenses would be over a three-month period. 
point being is that's exactly where we should be with our cash reserve. What we're going to be doing this year with 0% allowable growth or <coughs> no money coming in, we will be spending out of our savings account. And we'll know by December, give or take, exactly where that's going to look at and we can be more exact about the figure. But there's absolutely no doubt that that 2.1 million, give or take some pennies, is going to go down this year because we don't have 0% zero, zero coming in. Well, we have 2.1 million in our operating account and then we have a savings account on the side? No, that's our savings account is okay. what I'm talking about, Gene. All right. Yeah. Good question. The thing that none of us want to do is to sit on a board that ignores all of the ramifications of declining enrollment, uh, allowable growth being held low, the increased costs, the uh, increased requirements of the Department of Education to uh, increase the quality of uh, your programs, especially since this education summit, and ignore that and then have the uh, incentive money disappear in five years and suddenly we're sitting there looking at a very bleak situation financially and then having you people point the finger at us and say, what were you thinking about? Didn't you look down the road at all? Couldn't you see this coming? I'm not going to stand there time. You don't have to. Okay. Uh, have we looked at anything to uh, cut our expenses? Have we looked to do anything drastic? And I don't mean uh, cutting the one staff. I'm not talking about we, one coach or one staff. I'm talking about something drastic to uh, maybe cut our expenses. Two years ago, we we cut to the limit, we thought. In fact, our comments at that point were the next cuts will affect programs. We don't want to go there. Well, I was at that meeting. We cut, just an example, and we cut six coaches, and I'll guarantee we hired them all back at that meeting. But, that, I mean, I'm not here to, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to cut teachers. Let's put it that way. I don't want, I want to cut teachers, and I don't want to cut programs. But I'm, well, I'll just say right here, uh, Ken Larson sat here, and I didn't drag him in on that, so don't, he's not part of this comment, but we graduated in Sac City. And we had 1,200 students, and we fit in two buildings. We got 900 students, and we got four buildings. And we looked at doing, and I'm not saying which buildings, I'm just saying I don't, I, Gene Riley's personal opinion, I don't know if we need four, four buildings. Yeah. Have we thought about doing anything there? Well, it's my opinion that that would be the next place you look. I mean, before you cut any more staff or programs, that's, that's the next logical spot when you have consolidation. You start closing buildings. Next place to look. And well, I think we could be more efficient, but then I'm not sitting in your sh I'm on this side of the table. You know, it's always easier on this side than it is on that side. But I'm just wondering if we've even thought about closing one or two buildings and only. I mean, because I know, I know that we got 300 more kids that we sit and we've got in two buildings, and there's no way we need four buildings with 900 kids. Well, one of the things that's changed is the programs have changed a lot since you gentlemen graduated from high school. We've got, we've got a lot more program involved than we did then, so we need more space. Now, we're getting to the point on where we can, I'm pretty sure, uh, going to need one fewer buildings shortly. And we have discussed that but uh, not to the point of where is the cut going to be made or anything like that. But when the enrollment gets to the point that you can't justify the buildings, we'll have to, we'll have to look at that. Let's, let's take it a step further, too, because um, it's a very astute question, and it, it's not going to be a great observation that, that you're making. Um, one of the things that's different than when the situation, Gene, that you were talking about is the geographic size of the, the new district of going north of Sac City to south of Wall Lake. 
and that that's one of the things. Um, and is there money to be saved by closing a building? There absolutely is money to be saved. Uh, is that something that's on the table in the next uh, uh, next year? Uh, I would say no, it's not. Are we going to start the study and looking at what possibilities there are? It is. It's basic economics when you know that you have a financial situation looming ahead. You're either going to cut the amount of expenses or you're going to increase the revenue. And I've been very blunt that we need to be looking at both of those options. Okay. Um, the other thing is about closing a building, and let's just talk elementary. Um, I'm going to say two things, I, I, I guess. One is that uh, the history of, of when ESAC came together, in, or SAC and WLVA came together, as I've been told by multiple people, I wasn't here, but as I was told, is the configuration of grades really dealt with equity between the communities. Why? Because I asked, why do we have a grade 5 through 8 middle school and all of this? And, and that is not a criticism whatsoever. It is not a criticism. Uh, it's just reality. One of the things that uh, I've started to talk to the administrators about is I would like to see this district have a discussion on where our various grades are, but not basing it on communities, basing it on answering the question, what is in the best interest of student learning and kids? Because I don't believe that discussion is taking place. That will be taking place. It will lead to some, I don't know where it will lead. And maybe the way we're doing it is exactly right, but we haven't had the right kind of discussion yet. The other thing is, is about closing a building. Uh, is that uh, there are ramifications for that, dire ramifications. Uh, you end up, depending because of the geographic length, again, dealing with elementaries from one end of our district to the other, uh, losing families that are going to go someplace else because they don't want their kid on a preschool kid on a bus for whatever. I mean, I don't know the details, but all of those things you have to factor in. Um, so I guess the straight answer from me is that Yes, we will look at all aspects of controlling our budget. And the point about uh, having four buildings in three different communities is a valid point for consideration. But I would not look you in the eye and say that's going to happen in the next year or the next two years. We're going to study this and we're going to do it right when the time comes. Like it or not, that's my answer. The thing I think about when you talk about pools and building is, yeah, you're going to have some cost savings, but you're still going to probably have those teachers or part of them. And in in the school system, the biggest expense is salaries. Yep. Right? About 80%. Well, salaries and benefits. benefits right. So, you know, if, if you talk about cutting a building out, you're going to save some expenses, but you're still going to have a big part of them because you're still going to probably have to have well, teachers. You, well, what we could argue about that, but... The maintenance and the heating and cooling in one building is, by I'd say, four or five teacher salaries. It's but I don't. I mean, we can argue about that, and nobody's got the facts in front. Well, maybe you guys do have the facts in front of you, but we don't have that facts in front of you. So you're doing it the right. You had the right answer. But I mean, we could. I could argue with Chris on that, but we don't have the facts to do that. Or I don't. Maybe you do. But no, I don't. Uh, two years ago, I'll just give you one example because this was a fact. Two years ago, when I was coaching, I went to practice early, and I we I walked around that grade school in Sac City, and there was seven empty classrooms. I talked to one of your staff. You weren't even here, so I talked to one of the staff. Said, "Don't, Gene, you're wrong. There's nine empty classrooms up there, and that's the newest building we got." Now I'm not sticking up for. I live right in the middle. I've got the. I'm the happiest guy in the world because I'm the count when the before the line was drawn. My gravel road was a dividing line, so it doesn't make me a difference. I mean, I'm three miles from Lakeview, and I'm three miles from Sac, so I'm as happy as can be that the way things are. But I'm just saying that there's a building there with, according to one of your staff, before you were here, there's nine empty building, nine empty classrooms in, in that elementary building. Well, absolutely, there's space in the building. You're right. All right. Well, no, no. And I'll just confound this even further, but it's a point to ponder because I anticipated that being a question. Um, and I'm glad it is a question. It needs to be out in the open. Um, when you look at physical facilities, uh, the newest building that we have is Sac Elementary. And after this summer, it's a you people need to get into that building. It's a, it's a, it's a view, the work that's being done this summer. Um, but when you look at enrollment, um, 
enrollment at Sac Elementary on the last day of school was 182 students. Uh, at Wall Lake was 221 students. Are and we counting K through? That's, that's preschool through fourth grade. Thank you. Yep. That's pre through four. Mm -hmm. And so uh, common sense says you look at the newer building. But then you, where this gets complicated, and I'm not advocating one way or the other, I'm just sharing. Where this gets complicated uh, or gets messier is the fact that uh, common sense would say that the SAC Elementary is where it ought to be, but then you're going to be looking at moving the largest number of kids the furthest distance. Is that in the best interest of kids? I'm not going to answer that at this point, but that's where people that, that, that would advocate closability, it's more complicated than that is my point. Well, you said there's 200 kids in, in Wall Lake, but it's, I don't know how to divide it, but let's say half of those are Lakeview kids. It's almost the same distance from those overall Lakeview kids. Oh, yeah. So now you're 300, 100, but I don't, I don't know. It, it might not be 50, it might be 60, 40. Yeah, I don't and know. I don't know what the breakout is by community either. But so you're not going numbers. to, uh, that could be a lot different number depending on. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. But my point is we need to study this and we need to do it right. And I also think that there may be people in the communities that say maybe a school would be closed that would be saying, well, you know, we should have looked at the instructional support levy before we closed the school and at least tried to get it to pass. You know, the, the, there are people who really want a school in their community and we can't blame them. And so this is, I think, a, a, a reason why we are doing this. But we're still all taxpayers. Tax yeah, exactly. True. Um, I just like to make a comment. Um, Mar, you're right. Everybody likes to have a school in their, in their area. But <clears throat> we're coming together now as one district. We've been dating for, what, three years? Yeah. This is a marriage now. Sure. When you go into a marriage, you do it gradual. You look at everything. You take it easy. You don't do anything drastic. I agree with Gene. We may, we, as a board, you need to be looking at facilities, all the facilities. And in time, maybe we need to close anything or a building. But right now, I think we should just kind of hang tight. Our main goal is to get this instructional support levy so we have funds to keep us going down the road. And as a board, it's your responsibility, I think, to look at the buildings. <clears throat> Maybe down the road in three years or so, if something's up, our, name, our numbers drop a little bit, maybe we can look at doing a building. But I think right now we need to get our funds in good shape because you don't know what's going to happen down the road. And the instructional support, I, I you know, I'm, I'm here to, to support it. Um, right now, I, I, I believe the property and the surtax is the way to go. That's my feelings. I think we need to try to get as much information out to the public so they all understand it. You know, everybody, you know, thinks I own property. All the liabilities on me, you know, with the street tax, we can spread it over a little bit. We can, but we have to make sure everybody understands how it works, and that's that's my feelings tonight. Um, you know, I, I agree with Gene, but I think right now, I don't think we want to be messing with these buildings, and uh, but down the road we sure do. Well, you make a good point because right now we want to be building the the goodwill of the people in the district and if you come out the first year and say we're going to close a building you can be sure you're going to alienate a segment of the people immediately. You know I, I truly believe the kids are getting along great well, and the kids do. always do but it takes the community a little longer to work it out and I really believe we just you know let's, let's look at the funding make sure we get good funds in our, in our bank account. Um, you know, when I was on the board, Frank was there, we went through a funding period where we were bad. And you don't want to go there, let me tell you. And I'm sure Frank doesn't want to do that again either. So it's really a tough deal and so you know I, I just we really need to promote this and get her going. You know, I think you brought up a really good point that we need to get all the all the information out to the people. And and Kevin's had, I don't know, help me out. How many times have you had this in the paper? And we've talked about it at at least three or four, yeah. if not five, school board meetings. So how do we get this information to everybody so they know exactly what you're talking about? 
I have an idea. You're not going to like it. <laughs> I went to the web page today to see what time the school board meeting was. And I printed it off so you could believe me, but there's a school board meeting, nothing. School board minutes, nothing. School board agenda, June 27th. Front page of our thing, August 3rd, no, not, not even on the calendar. And then our calendar, it's not even on there. How are people going to know about it? You can't, you, but thank God for Curtis, I wouldn't know what time to been here. Guilty on all charges. I, I recognize that, Gene. And we're going to just, this will sound defensive, and it isn't, uh, is that uh, we converted to the new website about three weeks ago, and there are some uh, pieces that are not yet there. This is one of them. Uh, does it need to be better? Absolutely. Will it be better? Damn darn right it will be. Sorry. Point well taken. Thank you. Just being new to the district, I can tell you um, from where we come from and where I've been in past uh, places we've lived, uh, I got it. You got to admire the district that you guys have built here, and the dollars that you've got in your account now, because there's a lot of school districts that are not there, plain and simple. Um, I think something that you didn't talk about, uh, Dr. Feeney, would be how many school districts have this. You know, there are very few that don't have it. And I admire you guys for forward thinking because that's what you're doing. You're forward thinking, trying to get those dollars put in, put in the bank account to have those for those reserves. Because I can tell you, and you guys probably already know it, we're in a push down effect, a trickle down effect from the government, and we will have more expenses locally that we'll have to pick up, either be it the cities, the schools, the counties. There'll be more dollars that we'll have to pay for out of our pockets that we're not getting help from from the state and the government. So. Again, I support too, and I admire what you guys are trying to get done here. So, in answer to your question, uh, and thank you, Ken, because um, I put out before it was 348 out of 359 or whatever. That was last year. The new data, uh, fiscal year 12 statistics. There's 351 total Iowa school districts. 334, which is 95 percent of the districts, have some form of ISL. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, we're in the, our, our tax askings are in the lowest 10% in the state. That's nothing to really be proud of, <coughs> but it's a fact. So I don't think that we're, ha that we have been overtaxing our people for education. Well, I think, Chuck, that's, that's I think that's something to be positive about because, you know, we're, we're running on a, on a low tax basis, and we're still doing a good job, but we're aware that things are going to get more expensive, and we're going to try to raise some funds someday, and this is the way to do it. Yeah, I think you're right, too, Chuck, to say if in two or three years, if we are in dire straits and we don't and didn't look at this, you know, then you're going to be in, in a hot spot. Yeah. I sat on a board. Good deal, like Jim did, where I had to appear before the Budget Review Committee. And I said then, that's never going to happen again if I can help it. That is not a pleasant experience. Yeah, it's easier to pass stuff when you aren't asking for anything. I mean, right now you don't even know if you need zero one. It's harder to pass when you got to go to the table and say, we need 10%, we need it now. Um, it's a lot easier to get something passed and have it in your back pocket. Kind of, so. I, I, I think there would be a good chance that if we pass this thing in September that uh, our askings next year would be very small, mm -hmm. if any. But it's there. It's a, it's the safety net. But you're being fiscally responsible. I mean, that's what you're doing. I think the other thing, too, to make sure people understand is that, you know, property tax is always a year in arrears. So if this were to be approved in September, you know, it goes on the, uh, as of July 1st next year. So we're at least... Uh, we would be at least 12 months out before receiving any of that. And if it ends up having income surtax, that's 18 months behind before you ever get any money into your local district. Uh, and so some people have asked, well, right now you're sitting in a very good financial position, which we are. Why now? Why not wait a couple of years until such time that you have a little better data on what the, the savings is doing? Um, 
And, and there's validity to that question, obviously. Um, my position and, and, uh, is with advising the board is that um, because of the time amount that's before you see any of that revenue, this is the perfect time to be making that insurance policy available for this district so that we are financially stable. Uh, and with the, the trust and the, what's in, everything that's included in that is that the board is not going to tax at a rate higher than needs to be taxed and that we are going to be good fiscal <coughs> managers by looking at the revenue side as well as the expense side. And that's really what this is, is about, is putting us in a position to have some options when we know what's going to happen, happens. And that's where we're all of a sudden looking at a hole of a half a million dollars in our budget. Patrick, Lisa. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the spending authority side of it, because it's going to yeah. affect that. Is that going to, is that set at the same percentage as what you would tax? So if, it, if you tax 10%, your spending authority goes up by 10%, or is it, is it direct correlation? Uh, it is, except you have to take out the state aid piece of it, uh, Lisa. Okay, so it should be 8%. Yeah, whatever that figure whatever works that out. Figure. But the spending authority for the district goes up with the instructional support levy proportionally, except it doesn't go up 10%. It goes up whatever that number is okay. because no state aid coming through. And the spending authority, Frank may have to jump in here. Uh, it's it's really uh, sometimes, and I think Siegel and, and Buck, uh, Margaret talk about it, uh, it's really the amount that is legal for your district to spend. It's a cap. You can't spend more than this amount, and that's set by formula. This raises that amount, but it doesn't dictate you have to spend that. And that goes back to John's question. Do you have to, uh, if you get this approved at 10%, do you have to do it at 10%? The answer is no, you don't. But we now have the spending authority to do that legally if it's necessary. Does that make sense? Yes. How'd I do, Frank? That's good. Okay. We're always careful to keep our spending authority fairly high so that we have the ability if we need it. That doesn't mean we're... Just because you have the authority doesn't mean you have to spend the money. Steve. Um, does this... You know, we had two programs that expired June 30th. Is that correct? And this will just be kind of the, the next step in replacing those two programs? Yeah. Uh, Zach had... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um... SAC had the 10-year uh, voter approved uh, pebble, and that was at $1.34, right? But the, the, at the, the SAC board two years ago, I believe it was, opted that there was no need to, to levy that, so that wasn't levied the last two years. That expired uh, as of uh, June 30th. Uh, Wally View Auburn had the uh, instructional support levy at 10%. Uh, that, too, expired as of June 30th. Um, and with reorganization, there were some rules about if one district had something and one district didn't, how that worked. But for this consolidation, it didn't matter because both of those voter approved levies uh, no longer exist. So that means for 11-12, uh, the current fiscal year that we're in, we don't have the instructional support levy and we don't have the, the voter approved pedal. Is that the WLPA1 instructional support levy at 10%? What were we asking for? Were we at the maximum? I believe you were. I don't have that in front of me, but yes, you've been paying that in this district for the last 10 years. Did we have the income on it? Yes. Did have income, did you we had have income sir tax as well. You did? Yep. See, you didn't even know that, did you? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I didn't even know that we'll have to make an interest. So if I'm reading right, we're all, we would be okay if this 581000 came in for the next 10 years, but it quits in 2015, right? I mean, we're probably okay until 2015. Maybe. I don't know. Hard to say with enrollment. That's the other piece of this. But, you're for something but yes, that's, that's the biggest that's chunk if that's what you're getting at. You're looking for this to make up this 581,000. We're looking to have options to deal with that and declining enrollment and increased expenses, yes. And the lack of the current State I mean, funding. Current funding. I mean, yes. obviously the funding is going to be and the for this year, since we don't have either one of those. Yes. And, and the fact that we don't know what the legislature is going to expect of us uh, from year to year. You know, they could they could go crazy after this education summit and uh, come in with a bunch of mandates unfunded. 
and it will surprise me if they do a considerable amount of that. But I have no way to find it, so I mean, it's, that's the way it'll be. <clears throat> it's, it's been their history. Chris? What happens at the end of 10 years, if it passes, does it go, would it have to be re-voted on yes. again, or could the board at that time choose to just do it, or both of those are options at the end of 10 years? At the end of 10 years, we could re-vote it, or the board could choose to uh, put the five-year one in place, as long as which we could change. do now. I mean, the rules could change between now. Sure. Yeah. 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 They could have put it in without vote, correct? Five years for five years. Takes a simple majority to pass? Yes. However, the people could petition that, and you'd have to take it to a vote, so. If, if the board would have. Yeah, if the board had put in the five-year uh, instructional support levy, and uh, the people petitioned against it, they could make you take it to a vote, so. Uh, I think it. I think it just makes sense to take it to the people. They're the ones that are going to pay it. It's their school district. Uh, but let them, uh, this is a decision they should definitely be involved in. It's just like the, the consolidation vote. <clears throat> and then the other factor of that is, is you just got to get the information. Right. I mean, because there's going to be all kinds of stuff flying around there. And that's not going to be true. I mean, we've seen all that before. It's just got to be uh, presented to the public in a, in a simple manner, I think. As simple as you can. Chuck, were you on the board when, when WLBA passed the instructional support levy with the combination? If I recall, that was a little bit difficult down here. Census surtax and then property tax combined, it was just more of a confusion yeah. amongst the community. Not so much they were totally against it. That's right. Um, I mean, do you, get, you have advice of how to help people really understand it? Well, the most difficult thing is to get people to be willing to get themselves educated on the point. You know, tonight is an opportunity, but who's here? You know, you're kind of preaching to the choir. And uh, so we, I think we've got to have some public meetings We've got to break this down into bite-sized chunks and get it in the paper, get it on the website, uh, things of that nature. You just got to have to bombard people with uh, information from different positions and hope that they will see uh, what you're trying to do, why you're trying to do it. And and maybe some just hardcore examples, you know, typical like family income, $60,000, you know what I mean, right. which, yeah. you know, the tax, you know, maybe just some black and white numbers of... Uh, just how, how this will affect right. you. Right, right. What we hope to yeah. do, if you go with income surtax, is really um, make it um, go to this line on the 1040 form, multiply it times this, that's how much it's going to cost you, kind of... Right. Simple thing. And actually for the property tax, uh, there's a couple scenarios uh, in your packet about if you have taxable valuation of 50000 what your tax liability would be. Uh, and we'll continue to, to, assuming this goes through, uh, continue to uh, give those examples that everybody, because I think it goes back to that second question, everyone wants to know right. what is this going to cost me, and that's a fair question. Is it really going to cost them anything more? than it was now. Was SAC, you, you know, I guess I mean, we haven't been paying that dollar thirty four, but, you know, in the end. Yeah, well, it just uh, depends on the, on the mix of what the property tax is and what and taxable what valuation and all of that for the whole district. But just to give you an idea, if you were on the SAC side of the district uh, last year, you paid $12 and some cents. Uh, per thousand of taxable valuation, and WLBA paid $11.85 and some change. Um, this year, your tax liability, property tax liability for the school portion is $10.07. So virtually everyone in the district has $2 less property tax per thousand. And as long as I'm on a roll, we just have to make sure, too, that uh, we want people to understand you don't go to what your um, what your assessed valuation is. There's a 48, uh, this year it's set at 
I got it here. I think it's 48.5 cent rollback. So what you do in doing the math, if you have a $100,000 property, then take that times 40, or take away 48.5 cents, that's what your taxable valuation is. That's what you use for a figure. And that'll be confusing if people don't understand that rollback. Um, if that's why we always use the term taxable valuation, not assessed valuation. Yeah, but I think what Lisa, I think you hit it on, hit on it there, and what Lisa's saying is that you need to put it so you're making sixty thousand dollars. It's going to cost you ten dollars. If you own one hundred sixty acres, it's going to cost you whatever. You need those kind of examples because people aren't going to read booklets. They're not going to read ten pages. They're going to read about three or four of your highlights. But if they say, "Oh God, I own one hundred sixty. It's going to only cost me ten dollars. It's fine." Or, "I own a hundred thousand dollar house. It's only going to cost me." whatever, $12, I don't know the figures, but right. those are the kind of examples that people uh, will relate to and get your point across faster than uh, having to read 10 pages. Right. What do you think? How do you feel about this? I'm in favor, and I, but I, I think the combination, even though it's going to be confusing, the community is, is the best route. That's my own. Is there anybody here, uh, I don't you know, this thing is broken into two public hearings, which uh, with this size group, and I think a lot of consensus. Uh, is there anybody here that thinks it should be property tax only? The only reason I do is because it, it makes it clear cut, easier for the people to understand. That's the only reason. It's not a fairness issue. It's if, it, if you want to get it passed, pass the first time, guarantee you pass the first time, in my opinion. It's easier to explain one thing than two. That's my only thing. But if the board decides to go with both, I'm fine with that deal. I don't want to have nine votes on this. I don't, you know, I like to pass one first time and then, <coughs> then we'll let us deal with it a little bit. I know that's, that's giving the public, it's giving us a lot of trust with it, but um, if, if it goes to the voters three or four times, that's going to be a difficult so, scenario. So. That would be my only concern with just doing it, or to do an income surtax to, is it's more confusing. Yeah, and I think some people that do understand it, Brent, that are landowners, would probably want it the other way. Well, I understand that too. Right. too. But you got a valid point. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there's probably two ways to look at it. No, and I understand that. I'm a, I'm a property owner too, and the way I look at it, I got five houses that I rent out. I feel that they're paying, the renters are paying my property tax. I mean, they give me money, I give it to them. Tax man. To me, they're paying. It. I, I don't. That's how I look at that too. So. Yeah, and that might be different than land owner that owns a lot of acres. It might be. But also on the other side of that, it's a lot easier for people to go to their state tax and look at line number 17 mm -hmm. and times that by whatever percent that is. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Instead of talking about rollbacks, you know, it's pretty easy to do the surtax just by looking at that. Line well, I agree with Brent. Politically, you do a uh, you do a street property tax. You can just look at someone and go buck forty nine per thousand. Explanation done. Not go look up some forms, figure this out for yourself kind of stuff. It's about getting it voted in. The second time, it'll just be a renewal. We've already got it. I think the other thing I want to clarify too, because some people that I've, I've talked to, when I read the information about instructional support program, uh, it says what's the minimum, of, you can't have strictly income surtax. And when I read the information, it indicated to me that you had to have at least a dollar of property tax. Well, that's been clarified. I interpreted that as you have to have one dollar levy, and then the rest is made up by income surtax. That is not correct. You have to literally generate a minimum of one dollar in property tax, and the rest can be income surtax. And I want to clarify that publicly. So you could have a property tax if you wanted to go heavy on income surtax. Um, you could have a, a tax levy of point zero 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 two or something like that to generate the minimum. It's one dollar. It's not one dollar of, of of the levy. And I go, oh. There, you can't generate enough with just a surtax, can you? Probably not. 
the average, and, and this is just, I, I thought, fascinating, the current average uh, in the state uh, of every school district that has the ISL, the average property tax levy is 54 cents per thousand taxable valuation. That's the average across the state for, for property tax. And I don't know what that means other than I thought it was interesting. So do you have the information on what percent there? You know, between the zero and ten, what the average is? Uh, actually, on this sheet, uh, that last scenario, that last column, next to it says number of districts at this level of the ISL. It doesn't. It, oh, I see. Okay. That'll give you the total number. It doesn't break it so out exact is what you're talking about. But actually, but most of them are at ten. Yes. Okay. The about three hundred five of the total have a ten. Or have it at ten percent. And actually, there is a spreadsheet, it's just not this year's that I have that shows every district and what the breakout is. You want to be that specific. You know, talking about the dollar, and if you have to have at least a dollar, that means we have to get up to 7%. If I'm looking at this right, that's a dollar five. If you were going to wreck it, um, you couldn't generate all. You couldn't generate your max with just an income surtax. I don't believe. No, but we'd have to get up. We'd have to get up over seven percent. Yes. To even start with income surtax, which is three hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. Right. If you look above that. Yep. So maybe the easiest thing to do. I mean, we're going to get another one hundred and thirty thousand dollars if we had the income surtax, and that's going to make it more difficult. So maybe the easiest thing to do is just say straight property tax. But right now, based on the current figures uh, that you have in front of you, uh, to generate for ESAC, to generate the maximum amount, the largest, uh, if it was property tax only, the largest levy right now would be $1.49 per thousand of taxable valuation. That's if it's property tax only. And you were levying at the full 10%. That's where that last page, as you play with it more, really is useful. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. I, I would really, really like to see uh, our goals. I'd like to see what our short-term goals are, our mid-term goals are, and our long-term goals are. And I'd really like to have that in print, like maybe, I think when I'm kind of like, Kim, I don't want to talk about closing the school because as soon as you do this, a community gets upset. So I don't want to mention anything. But I'd like to say, I'd like to see a short term goal, which would be your one to two years, a mid term goal, which is your three to five years, and then your long term goal, where you're going to be in 10 years because you're asking for this money for 10 years. But I'd like to know what the school board's plan is as far as uh, hiring 10 more teachers or uh, closing a building or. Fire and ten more teachers. I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing out ideas. But I do not. First of all, I want to know. I do not want teachers to suffer. Now, support staff and uh, people like that. And that's what I'm going back to, Chris, on your closing buildings. You got a lot of people that support that building that aren't teachers. And sometimes that's where the savings are. But again, me and you could discuss that all night. We're not. I don't want to do that here. But I would like to see. Let's close the uh, public hearing on uh, the combination and convene the public hearing on property tax only funded. We've been dealing with both of them. But we'll uh, move into that area. If there's anything more to be said about that, if not, we'll adjourn the whole thing and then the board will. Have to make a decision here. Well, I would just comment. I, I support both. I think the challenge for you as the board in six weeks is to get it out to the people and explain it in a way that they can also support it or not support it. I think that's real challenging. Looking at this packet, you know, I haven't looked at it hardly at all, and to try to get that message out in 
you know, before election time, I think is going to be your, ma your major challenge. I'm not saying that it can't be done, but um, I think that'll be the biggest part. I, I personally support uh, both. You know, uh, I applaud you what you're doing. You're looking down the road. I, I think it's uh, the way to go. But it, is it going to be a hard sell because of it, it is kind of confusing? I would say unless it gets cleaned up, I think it would be. Um, but. Is, there, is there a simple way to express this? I think yes. Um, I think it's take the key bullet points and, and put it all onto one page. and have the specific data on uh, how much is this going to, I mean, I think we have to, I think, feel a responsibility to make a case, why are we asking you to give us more money? And three or four bullet points like they've been listed, that's just data. And then specifically, how much is this going to cost you? Have the scenarios like various people have, have said, and have that on one page, I think it is doable. And then have it linked to more detailed information for those that want, that like to read. That's off the top of my head. To the WLBA LBA folks, it's, it's not necessarily going to cost them. They've been paying it for the last however many years. Up until this year. Yeah. So this year it's going to go down, and then next year we're... So, you know, really it's not going to cost them any more than it has been, correct? Just they're going to get a one-year break, and then whatever happens, happens. It was at first... Actually, we were paying couples, so yeah. it's actually yeah. gone down for both districts, and I'm sure everybody got a phone call thanking, thanking you guys for that. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think, I mean, that's, that would be the number one bullet point is, yeah, you know, it really isn't going up. That we had these in the past. We had these in place. Yeah. In, in our situation, the Pebble Fund is so restrictive. You know, we can't use it. You can't use it on things that really help kids, whereas this, you can. Yeah. That's the thing that everybody needs to keep in mind, is that is this is not for Dr. Feeney or Chuck or Lisa or me. It's, you know, it's for the kids. That's the main thing. Dr. Feeney, um, the, pep, this, the structural support goes in the general fund, correct? It comes in as miscellaneous income, right. but it's used as in general fund. The sharing money that we get is that just for the general fund too, or is that allocated to different areas? Like general when we were general, 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 I believe yeah. it does. Yeah, that's all right. It's all general fund. Okay. Yeah. It's based off of sharing time between the Teachers positions and all that. And all right. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like it was. It's still that way. Mm -hmm. But it all goes in general. general fund. Okay. And are you going at the direction that one would end up replacing it? As you go, is that where you're going with that? Yeah. Well, I think you got to almost plan in the back of your mind. And, I mean, if it does, it's 180 days between elections, right? 120, or 120. 120. Yeah. Does that give you time in the budget or not? Point that would be like four months, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, it would, um, but then you're looking at a real tight timeline all over again before budget time. It's not a bad idea to have a back in the line if something happens. Uh, one other comment, I think, uh, I think Chris just said, but that pebble money I think you might need to explain that because people don't understand uh, that you don't use it for buildings and structures, and you spend all this money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and people who don't understand it say, well, those people, what the heck are they doing? Why don't they hire 10 more teachers rather than spend $200,000 on Wall Lake and $100,000, I forget the town, $100,000 in Sac City or $100,000 in Lakeview, and I don't think people, they just... They just don't get, some people just don't quite understand how that works. The 
and they never will. <laughs> In order to understand it, a person has to spend some time dealing with it. You know, these things don't just come to you naturally. It, and uh, school finance is probably as messed up as any kind of financing that there is because, you know, people think that all of our money is in one pot. Not the case, you know. You've got different funds within the school uh, finance system and it's hard for people to comprehend that. I think you guys should make a motion to, to, to try to get it on the ballot as a combo, and if you five can't decide that, then try to go as an income for a property owner. That's my favorite. Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve it. I'm still concerned about explaining this. How are you, uh, explain income surtax in a 30 second radio spot. It's the percentage, you take the percentage time, the amount of tax that you pay to the state of Iowa, that's what your tax liability is. And what's... Say you owe, say you owe $2,000 in income tax, <coughs> and the surtax is 10%, it's 200 bucks. Exactly. Now, is that 200 additional dollars, or is that 200 coming out of 2,000? That's going to be a question. Interesting. Right, right. It's additional dollars. Well, the state's still going to get their 2,000. Yeah, the state's still going to get their 2,000. It's going to be 200 dollars. It's not going to get less any of it, but they're so still going to get it. So people are going to want to know that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's additional dollars. Now, how's that, going to, how's that going to add together with the property tax? Chris okay. started to touch on it earlier. Depends on what the split that the board decides. If say they decide that uh, they, they want to use a uh, dollar of property tax, um, that would generate about three hundred thousand dollars in our district. And I just use a dollar because I can do the math in my head on that one. Uh, three hundred million taxable valuation in, in the district generates three hundred thousand dollars. Then we would go back and figure how much of the percentage. Uh, to raise the rest to get to four hundred forty-seven thousand three hundred ninety-seven dollars, then that would be the income surtax piece of it. You have to work backwards. That's what I was talking about before. When you have to, you have to get two seven percent to even start the income surtax because that's a dollar five. Yeah. And the other thing to remember is what you're going to be asking the voters, uh, assuming you go forward. Say you went with a combination. The resolution that they're voting on just simply says a combination of property tax and income surtax. That's up for the board to figure out when it comes budget time next year on what the split is. It does not, that's not something that the public is voting on. They're voting on the funding stream and then you have to put the details to it. But it could be safe to say that we may not get to the income surtax. If we, if we go 5%, then we won't even get to the income We'll have to put a pencil to it, but yeah, I understand the concept, and that's it's possible. Lisa, but can you still both do both? Even if you want to, you can still do combo if you only do two percent of property, and you can do a certain percentage of right surtax. If you have permission to do both, then it's a matter that you have to generate at least a dollar of property sure. tax, and then you can split it out any way that the board so desires, within the limits, of course, which is what you're looking at. Lisa, sorry. Well, after Chris's explanation, I don't know that it would be worth doing the, for the confusion that it's going to cause, because they're going to want to know black and white numbers, and you're not going to be able to give them to them, because it's still in the board's hands. Am I looking at, am I saying that right? So you might as well. No, I don't think so. No, you're not saying it. You might as, as long as you have that dollar. Yeah, yeah you might as well just go no property dollar. tax and forget the confusion, and you can still have the flexibility of what percentage of that is going to be. You what no, six weeks isn't a very long time. No, it's not. Say it again. Well, if you look at the bottom, the bottom graph here. Yep. Look at the left side of it. It says seven percent. That's a dollar five. And you that's. Can, you have to have at least a dollar. You have to have at least a dollar total income, not a dollar of certain. You don't need a dollar levy. That's where you I was wrong. You just need a dollar. I mean, you literally have to generate one dollar. 
not one dollar per thousand. <laughs> Chris, scratch that. Off. I know. I didn't want to tell you. I, I thought somebody else was right. <laughs> You're wrong. No, don't worry. I was the same way when I found that out. I went, oh. It really gives so the district more flexibility mm -hmm. this way. Well, there's a lot of validity in, in what Brent said, too. You know, if, if you're a property owner, uh, your tenants, if you're, if you're renting housing or if you're renting ground or if you're taking a crop off of the ground yourself, that's all built into that, so I don't know if there's any reason to confuse it with, by having it come from two sources or not. If you had six months, it'd be a lot easier to get it to four different communities. You have six weeks, and there, you know what I mean? It, it's four communities. Yes. Well, the only thing on the, we're an agricultural community, and I think if you do both, I personally think it would pass easier than if you just do property because you got, you got to remember, I work with farmers every day and I love everyone on them. But when it comes to property and paying taxes, you just got to burr under the saddle, you know. Uh, and then you got some people that make very good incomes in the community and don't own very much, but they make a lot of money. So. That's why I'm saying both, but I understand what everybody else is saying too about explaining it. Straw vote. <laughs> well, you need to, if there are any other comments, I'll right, you to adjourn that next time. If you sell it as an instructional support levy, so you can come from two sources, I think that's the biggest hurdle right there. I, I, I think you get into too much detail to try to give the general public. I think you're right, and I think if you then have some general examples, if you make 25000 50000 or if you own this much property, and you give some examples that are close, close, but say that these are not exact. Yeah. I think we've hit the why. You know, why are you going to do it? Is it going to be the biggest problem? Go ahead. Line 17 of your 1040. You're going to take a percentage of that. Is that a percentage you know for sure what you're going to take, or is that going to be something you determine? Right, okay. So, so that could change. So, uh, so these examples, I mean, that'd be your that'd be your road into explaining this. It would be if you if your line 17 on your last 1040 was this, and you own this much valuation land, or one th for every $1,000 we're going to do this. I mean, I, this is what these charts are doing, but... I need to clean it up and make it straight, more simple, straightforward. Yeah. I agree. Have two, have two pieces that come together, and this is what your family's going to pay. That would be, God, in six weeks. Well, unless there's a strenuous objection, I think we'll terminate this hearing and, uh, and we'll proceed to a board meeting and make a decision here. Okay. Thank you. And you're welcome to stay. Yes. Go on. <laughs> I'd like to call a special meeting of the Eastside County Board of Education to order. Uh, ask for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. I motion to approve the agenda. Second. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The single agenda item is to dis discuss and or approve the resolution to direct the county commissioner of the elections to call the election to submit the question of participation in the instructional support program. So, we need discussion or we need motion or we need whatever. Well, you know, I talked to a few people, and uh, it 
consensus was do both property tax and income surtax. tax. That seems to be what the consensus is here too. Uh, but we want to keep it simple. So. I can reason both ways. So my personal but, feeling would be doing both, but Hurt. How bad are you hurt if you do both? It confuses people and it fails, and then you come back with a simple property tax that 120 days. In 120 days. I would say that the, the biggest hurt is probably just having to go back to them again after you failed once. And at uh, the cost of election too. Yeah. The straight answer is that financially, right now, the district is in solid shape. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it won't hurt us financially. It's going to break a little bit. However, we've had other things fail and gone back to them a second time and been okay. Or seven times. Yeah, I can't. I think it's important what she said back here was, you know, each district had something. I think that's got to be really told when you and I talked. I didn't, you, you know, we didn't discuss that. Um, I think it's got to be told that one district had one and the other district had one, and now we're going to do this one together. Uh, that's a very valid point to tell everybody. I just think that makes that passage a lot simpler. Yeah, I think we should. I'll make the motion to put the, what, how, do I have to read it off here? Or anything? I, I want well, the, a form I'll make the follow. motion to have the support, instructional support levy funded by property and income surtax. We have heard the motion. Do you have a second? A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Frank, let's have a roll call vote. Okay. Lisa? Yes. Marty? Yes. Grant? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Chris? Yes. Thank you. And I think we just have to inform everybody that oh, we have to go it's work on for the instruction of, you know, for the kids. I think the Wall Lake area, you can say thank you for what you have done. And we appreciate the support us again. The SAC area, we need to sell. I think you're right there. I think it could be you a little know, tougher to sell. The Wallace and Lakeview area has been banned, so they're, yeah, yeah. you know. And it's, it's going to take people over. like you. Yes. I mean, <laughs> you. <laughs> you. <laughs> you. Yeah. But the SAC was paying a couple, yeah. so <laughs> we need to remind people of that. I don't look at it all like I mean, we don't want them to go out there and vote no just because they think it's going to cost them money or something. You know, that's what some people do. They're going to vote no. But I vote to adjourn. Or I motion. Second adjournment. We've got a roll call order on that. No. Yes. Oh. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.